Uh, lovely to be back, by the way. Um, the you know my schedule is nuts now because I'm traveling all around the country, trying to talk to people in person. But it does make it hard to keep any kind of a schedule at all. So anyway, let me get right down to business here. And one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do today, while everybody is so concerned about the every day of the of the politics that are happening in this country, one of the things that I'd love for you to do is to try and, while I'm talking, divorce yourself from the immediacy of, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? And try to see it um, like, like an, from an eagle's viewpoint. You know, so you can take a look at the political machinations and say, oh, I get it, as opposed to thinking, but what are they gonna do next? Because I think what that does is it really helps you to think about what come, might come next and what your role might be in making sure that the future you want is there. So let's start, first of all, with primaries. People have asked where we got primaries and what the primaries are all about and what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. Because today, as I am speaking, the primary in New Hampshire is underway. And they're a mess. Primaries are like, what on earth's going on? And what's a primary and what's a caucus and, and, and what's all that stuff going on? Well, the history of, the, of the, the primaries and the caucuses is this. You have to start from the premise of the fact that political parties are not part of our government. And that sounds stupid. It sounds like such an obvious thing. You're like, well, of course, but then wait a minute, they sort of are. So how does that happen? When the framers put together the Constitution, they did not expect that the, the people who supported the American Revolution would divide into parties or what they called factions. They believed that people would make short term alliances over specific issues and those alliances would fall apart when that issue was resolved and they would form different ones. And they're really quite articulate about this. This is why James Madison's Federalist Number 10 is so famous is because it's in Federalist Number 10 where he says, hey, you don't have to worry about their becoming major, you know, major uh, political juggernauts in this country because people will break down the same way that they break down religiously and there'll be different factions and nobody will manage to to take over the system rather like um, somebody explained it to me once like a faculty meeting if you're in a really small department it's easy to, to divide you know into two halves but if you're in a department of 350 it's very hard to divide people in two ways you basically have a bunch of little factions and that way they keep each other in balance so the framers did not expect that there would be political parties. So once we get the rise of political parties, and I'm not going to go through all this right now, although it's a really interesting story, and maybe someday I will, but let's get to how we get to primaries. Because if you think about the idea of political parties in the 19th century especially, what happened was leaders would decide who the presidential candidates were going to be. And they do it through a number of different ways, um, sometimes through nominating conventions, sometimes at the, at the convention conventions themselves, and this you saw a lot in the middle of the 19th century where there would be, um, you know, people would get to make speeches for one person or for another, and eventually they would all come down to deciding to stand behind one person. Well, what happens by the early 20th century is that it really appears that the political system has been taken over by the, the, the politicos, and the ordinary people say, hey, and we want to have a say in what we get to vote for for president. So you start to see in the early 20th century during the progressive era, the idea that ordinary voters should have a say in who gets to, to run for office and who gets to be the standard bearer for their party. But those are still in the early 20th century, just kind of a litmus test for the, the people running the parties to see whether or not they should run with one, one person or another. After 1968 and the sort of crisis of 1968, especially in the Democratic Party, then we get the idea of a binding caucus and a binding primary, the idea that a, a presidential candidate starts to garner um, uh, votes you know, for, from within the party and that those are binding. It's not just an advisory idea, it's, it's a binding idea. Okay, so now there's a couple things to remember about the primaries that are important and the caucuses. So the difference between a primary and a caucus is that generally, because remember, there's no rhyme or reason to this. The state parties can act however they want and the, and the national parties can act however they want. They do have rules and regulations that are voted on periodically. Um, I've, I've read a lot of them a few years ago for various stupid reasons, but, um, but they, they are changeable. 
and state parties can do things slightly differently than the national party if they want to so they have their own you know ways of doing things but anyway generally a caucus is they're all they're both run by the parties but a caucus is uh um, where the parties will get a bunch of voters together and have them express their preferences for a candidate or not, either by voting or by standing in one's place or in some, by show of hands in some way saying, hey, like, I like A, I like B. Um, the 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 parties both argued that they were going to democratize. That is, they were going to let more voices into the party, but they did it in really different ways. So the the Democratic Party said, "Okay, we're we really need to be much more representative of Americans. So we're going to let a whole new bunch of people vote. We're going to make sure that on our committees we have lots more women, lots more African Americans. We're going to really democratize this." And what they get from that is 1972 and what is sort of the debacle of 1972 when the Democrats nominate George McGovern, who loses every place except Massachusetts and the District of Columbia, which is just one of the biggest, I mean, the biggest blowout in American history. So after that, they add what are called super delegates. And those are people from within the governmental system in the Democrats and the governmental system who can say, no, 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 we're never going to be able to get this person through. So they are senators former governors, you know, people who have who are a weight against that popular voice. The Republicans do something very different. And the reason that this and you'll, and you'll know in a minute why I'm emphasizing this, the Republicans do something different. And what they do is they front load their caucuses into low information states. And the reason for that is because they can say, hey, look, we're letting everybody have their say, but they know that in low information states, people will tend to vote based on uh, name recognition. So that's why they expected in 2016, for example, that Jeb Bush was going to be, you know, up front and center because it was a name people knew. And then, of course, Donald Trump comes in like a wrecking ball because he's a name people know even better. So that's the history of the caucuses. And, and the reason that we are now where we are um, in, in terms of the Democratic Party, people have asked him, what on earth's going on with the Democrats? Why aren't they in New Hampshire and Iowa? But they sort of be in New Hampshire. And Iowa. They sort of appear to be in those states, but they're not really what's going on. Under um, Biden, the Democrats have switched their first official primary to South Carolina. So they're they're had previously they had been in New Hampshire and Iowa and they switched to South Carolina. And this of course has infuriated people in Iowa and New Hampshire, but what they, the reason they did it is is twofold. One, because they said quite accurately that Iowa and New Hampshire with their heavily white older populations are not representative of the nation, but crucially they're also not representative of the Democratic Party. So South Carolina actually has a demographic that's much more like the Democratic Party, that is much more um, m many more people of color, especially black Americans. So they do, did it for that reason, but they also did it because it was South Carolina that put um, President Joe Biden over the top in his primary in 2020. So there's a there's a sense that this is sort of his base. And so there's also something personal about saying, OK, we're going to let you be the first in the nation. It doesn't have to stay there in the future, but that's what they have done. And that's why they've done it. OK. So um, um, so somebody, somebody just asked, is this, um, was this ridiculous because um, uh, people in New Hampshire are unhappy? Not really, I don't think. I mean, honestly, the, it seems like it's a really big deal right now because everybody's reading about the primaries and the papers. And who, honestly, I, I'm probably gonna get a million things of hate mail. Who really cares about the primaries? You know, I know everybody's hot under the collar about it now, but before you think too much in the future, how many primaries can you really remember? I actually think it's it's not it's not a, a huge deal, but whatever. Anyway, um, 
So that's what's going on with the primaries. And that was the first question you asked. But let me um, back off a little bit and talk much more generally about where we are and how we are in the position we're in in this bizarro election. Okay, so let's start back in 2015. And you could even start much earlier than that. But let's start in 2015 when you have the Republican Party, which is essentially a party that is has really embraced the idea that the way that you make society work really well is that you turn it over to individual essentially businessmen to run it how they see fit because they're much more efficient they than a, than the government is they are the argument goes they rise based on merit and, and mind you i'm making this argument because i think you have to understand people's arguments that doesn't mean i'm advocating for it it means that i am explaining what they were thinking and their idea since 1981 had been to cut taxes and to cut regulations with the idea that if you concentrated money at the top of the economic scale, those people with money would use it really efficiently and they would use it most efficiently to do things like build new factories and that would provide more jobs for people and there would be more money and that would produce more tax dollars and therefore the economy would really just sort of boom based on cutting taxes and cutting regulations so those people could act however they wished. You did not want to have a basic social safety net because that would misuse that money that otherwise could be put back into the economy. So they they were busy from 1981 slashing the basic social safety net, slashing infrastructure, and also cutting taxes and regulation. But the problem as early as 1986 was that they recognized that people didn't like it. They liked Social Security. They liked Medicare. They liked roads and bridges. They liked all that stuff. And they didn't like the fact that people at the very top were getting extraordinarily rich. And the money was actually moving upward really dramatically after 1981. So again, as early as 1986, the Republican Party really grabbed hold of um, people that they could motivate based on either race, racism or sexism, traditional values, they called it. But these tended to be white evangelical Christians or traditionalists who didn't like the idea of women, women having equality in society. But the trick was, and they said this, the trick was that those people were supposed to provide the votes. And they would provide the votes in exchange for promises, for example, to get rid of Roe v. Wade or to make sure that there was prayer in schools or to, you know, do any number of things that um, that uh, that the traditionalists wanted. But the trick was they were only supposed to provide the votes. OK, so how did we get to where we are? Of course, when Donald Trump gets the nom runs for president, gets the nomination in 2016, he empowers those people. So now you have a Republican Party that has has basically been turned on its head. So rather than simply taking the votes of these people, they are now in the driver's seat through people like Donald Trump and Steve Bannon, one of his advisors, and Steve Miller, another one of his advisors. They are now the face of the Republican Party. But here's the kicker and how we got to where we are. And remember, Trump gave that that old guard, if you will, um, the tax cuts they wanted in 2017, and he is promising more tax cuts going forward. He's promising to cut Social Security and Medicare. He's promising to do those things he wants. But those you can't get votes that way. You get votes by turning out that white evangelical base. That is his strongest base. They turn out in huge numbers. They are the central Republican base now. So if you're a Republican, what are you going to do? because you need that base. You must have that base on board. You can't simply go back to, oh, we're gonna cut taxes and cut social security and everybody's, you know, come along with us and we will, we promise you someday we'll cut, we'll, we'll end Roe v. Wade, because they ended Roe v. Wade. That's not a stick any longer or a carrot any longer, that's done. So now what are you gonna do to turn out that base? And that's the problem for the Republican Party is that that old guard, that guard that wanted the low taxes and the, and the deregulation and all that, they would love to be back in power. And this is one of the reasons that people like the Koch family has been putting money behind Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina, because they believe that she is much more like them than she is like Trump. But she is not putting distance between her and Trump because she needs those voters too. So anybody who is running for the Republican Party right now must try and get Trump's voters in order to get that base or so they are so that so they are uh, behaving. 
Um, so somebody wrote and said, well, what could Nikki Haley have done? Nothing, nothing, because if she's gonna get that base, she has to appeal to Trump's base. But at the same time, she's sort of a wink and a nod to the old guards saying, well, I'm really, I'm really much more like you. But you know, you can't get the voters based on that. And here's the other problem for the Republican Party. And that's that the, that base, those base voters, that, that loyal base is never gonna switch away from Trump. They're his at this point. And this was the big question going into, 20, what year are we in, 2024? Going into 2023, after 2022, a number of us kept saying, will they jump away from Trump to somebody Trump-like? And people didn't really know. And, and now I think it's pretty clear they will not jump away from Trump. Trump is their candidate. And if he isn't running, they're not gonna turn out. And if they don't turn out, the Republicans are dead in the water. So that's the problem for the Republican Party is that aside from any of their beliefs, aside from anything that they might personally want to do, they are, what is it, the expression? They're like a, a pig with their tail in a crack because they have to try and pull those Trumpers and try and keep the rich guys happy. And you can't do both of those things. So, um, so what are they going to, to do? There's another, a couple other things that are really interesting to me about this. So one of them is that, um, I'm sorry, let me, do, let me go into it this way. So, um, so, so basically they're lining up behind Trump. But a number of us have been saying for a long time that that's a real problem. So because Trump has, uh, is, is in trouble on 91 counts, he's got these legal cases, but even more for, you know, for people like me watching it, if you've been watching Trump, he, he is mentally falling apart and you can't really miss it anymore. I'm sure you've seen it around the news today and that's not gonna get better. So now they've lined up behind a guy who's in real mental trouble. He doesn't look good, he doesn't sound good. And at the same time, he's got these legal cases that are hanging out there as well. And a number of people who sort of are holding their noses and saying, yeah, I could vote for him, but a conviction would change my mind. Uh, that's a real problem for the Republicans. So I'm surprised that Ron DeSantis dropped out, but I'm surprised. I'm not surprised if you look at his finances because his finances were crazily managed as in he spent more money on uh, private planes than he spent on advertising. I mean, he just didn't run a good campaign. But, but people keep saying that Nikki Haley is gonna drop out. Uh, she'd be crazy to drop out because it is it is we have a number of months still between now and the election and trump is not looking good you know trump is not looking good so if he falls by the wayside and she's the last person standing she could very easily pick up the nomination and that is um is one of the questions people asked what happens if he gets all the votes and then he's not able and for whatever reason to get the nomination to take the nomination well hasn't really happened before we certainly have seen it in um the in the 64 election with the democrats when hubert humphrey really got got you know it was not fair what happened to him with LBJ, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson pulling out of the nomination process after a number of the primaries were already gone by because Humphrey was running as his vice president then and they and he had to step forward and a lot of people said, wait a minute, you weren't, how, how on earth do you, do you suddenly get the delegates? We didn't, we didn't vote for you, we voted for the other guy who dropped out and that's why there was the big fight over uh, the other people running in, um, in, in 60, uh, 64. But um, no, not 64, 68. Is that right? Yeah, 68. Yeah, 68, I think. I'm sorry, I messed up in my years because I'm going back and forth so much. It's going to bother me though. 68. There we go, 68. Sorry about that, 68, not 64. Um, so, uh, so they are now, you know, for all that, that, you know, you're reading, oh, Trump's inevitable and all that, part of the reason that Trump is trying to look inevitable and remember, people behind him and look inevitable because the minute he doesn't look inevitable he's in real trouble 
And so you can see them really trying to push that idea that he is inevitable. Now, the other thing that that is on the um, on the uh, the menu here is dirty tricks. So one of the things that I'm watching very closely, very closely, and, and think about this, the Republican Party is not trying to win the 2024 election. Think about it. You know, they're not trying to appeal to people who might otherwise not vote for them. So, for example, as we know, a very recent poll says that 69 percent of Americans want to see Roe versus Wade reinstated. 69 percent. That's that's huge. That's almost that's almost 70 percent. Right. That's almost seven out of every 10 people want to see Roe v. Wade reinstated. And I think it's 12 or 13 percent who want who don't who want no abortion under any circumstances which is minuscule 10 to 13 percent you know that's not even two people out of 10. but the republicans are doubling down on the idea of an abortion ban across the country so clearly they're trying to cement that that extremist white evangelical base to them but what does it mean to run an election where you basically say to voters, you know, screw you, we don't care what you want, we're going to do it our way, which is what a number of state legislatures have done as well when the when the states have voted, state voters have voted, for example, for, you know, um, nonpartisan uh, districting or for abortion rights or for many of the different um, petitions that people put on the ballot, states have said, well, we're not going to let you petition anymore, or we don't care that that's what you voted for, we're going to do it our way. So if you are not planning to reach out to voters, and you're not planning to change your extremist message, what is your plan for winning in 2024? That keeps me up at night. So what is the plan for winning in 2024? Well, I think you can see a number of pieces moving. First of all, Trump is already talking about the vote being vigged. Now, mind you, there have been some polls, you know, I've talked about how the polls are not reliable. Some, repol some polls have said that Trump is ahead. Many have said that Biden is ahead. And most people will tell you that most polls are not worth reading at this point. But I think he's really trying to push the idea once again, as he said in New Hampshire within the last few days, the only way he can lose is if the vote is rigged. That's part of his whole attempt to destabilize the country and make people not believe that the elections are fair. And of course, there for all the lawsuits and all the recounts and everything else that happened in 2020, the only thing that's been turned up is, is miscounts that favored Trump, that, that hurt Biden. Um, there was a case in, in uh, Virginia, it came out about a week ago, in which Biden's numbers were undercounted by 4,000, not Trump's. And the voter fraud you have seen, which by the way is different than election fraud, voter fraud is individuals, election fraud is trying to steal an election, um, the, that's also been, been on the side of the Republicans, not on the side of the Democrats. So I think he's trying to convince people that the election has been stolen, uh, as he did in 2016 and in 2020. I also think that the Republicans are trying to manufacture an immigration crisis. And you, again, you can see this. You can see it all around you with the screams about how terrible immigration is and Biden's not doing anything and on and on and on. Well, Biden's doing a lot, but he has repeatedly asked, and, and I would go so far as to say begged Congress to provide more money for border security, more money for processing migrants, emphasizing, you know, trying to, to work with Mexico so that Mexico handles a lot of the people who are pouring from other countries through Mexico, including the people from Venezuela, for example, trying to stabilize countries. He's really trying his best to do things. And now, of course, the Senate has come up with a bipartisan immigration deal that the House Republicans just say, no, we're not going to look at it because they they want to turn out people to vote for them to vote for this extremist party based on their threats of immigration. And as you know, it's kind of a joke at this point that there's always caravans coming across the border during um, during election season. And you've seen all the statistics that that Obama, uh, that Biden and Obama both deported more people than Trump.
flooded, flooded, flooded with disinformation. And I don't just mean disinformation from the radical right, which you see already, on, for example, with the um, the House Oversight Committee and the House Judiciary Committee, which have been salting the media for months now with innuendo and allegations about uh, Joe Biden's alleged relationship with China, for example, even though we, we, we know Trump has admitted he took seven to eight million dollars from China while he was in office. And he said, well, I didn't do it for nothing. They were paying me for what I was doing for them. Biden has none of that. And this this you've seen probably today, the the uh, in yet another um, secret or, you know, private, um, not public, private, I guess, deposition of a, one of Hunter Biden's associates, um, the the committee once again went in front of the cameras and was full of, all, you know, said this guy had access to the White House and all sorts of things. And he and his lawyer came out yesterday and said, you need to release the whole transcript because you've done it once again. You know, my access was I went to, a uh, you know, the Easter egg roll or something like that. Um, and that transcript came out today and it's, yeah, there's nothing in it. But so I think you're going to see it not only that disinformation, not only from elected officials who are trying to spin the system, but also um, you've asked me about what's happening with Fawnie Willis in Fulton County, Georgia. And that's something I've been watching really closely. And the that too today, you have to remember that the person who made the accusations without evidence was an opposition researcher who had worked for Trump, who was up to his eyeballs in trying to get the election overturned, and who is famous for um, for uh, what he has called fraud. And um, I wrote it down here. Um, um, I don't remember. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, dirty tricks. And so once again, there's been this huge blow up of, oh my God, Fawnie Willis must have done something wrong. And maybe uh, the person that it, the issue is that one of the people that she appointed and who made, who is, she's paid or part of this um, investigation into the people who tried to overturn the election in Georgia in 2020, the presidential election, one of them allegedly she is having a, a personal relationship with it with, Documents were unsealed in his divorce today, and the people who read him say there's absolutely nothing there. Even if there is, there's nothing improper about it because um, they're both on the same team. He does have a very uh, impressive resume. So this is one of those things I think that you can put under the category until we learn more of salting the media with as much crap as you can throw at the wall with the idea of undermining the cases against Trump and his people and our judicial system. So remember that the accusations there, which do not have uh, have any, um, uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a credit card receipt in which the guy whose name is um, Nathan Wade, I think, bought airline tickets and, uh, and, a, and a, uh, cruise tickets and listed her as the person taking the cruise. That's it. That's that's all that you know. That's all the smoking guns there are. So, um, so I think that you're going to see uh, disinformation from from anything that we'll we'll throw to the wall. And also, do not forget, do not forget that Iran, Russia, and China, we already know, are flooding the United States with disinformation. And one of the things about it that, that I wanted to speak to is that it's very difficult to tell what is real and what is not. It is very difficult. So last night, I actually wrote a whole section of my letter, and I was mad at something that, that I thought the Biden administration had done, because it was over a byline that looked to me really legit. I mean, it was somebody who was in a legit place. And when I went to cross-check it, the only places I could find the details that this person had quoted were in Newsmax and you know the really far right stuff. And when I tried to chase it down, um, I couldn't find it. And I thought that's really interesting because even I, as careful as I try to be, 
maybe it's real, but you could not have proved it by me. And I actually had, I'd actually said to Buddy, I can't believe they did this. And here's the numbers and here's all this. And about 45 minutes later, I was like, I take it all back. You know, I fell for it. So one of the things that I would suggest that you do always, even for me, I mean, if I'd put that in the newsletter, you'd have thought it was real, is take a deep breath. You know, before you sit there and say, oh, I'm going to chase this down and see where it's from, just take a deep breath. If there is something that infuriates you because it sounds outrageous, it probably is. And with the caveat I would put in there, the warning that I would put in there is that, to my mind, there are now people in our public life who, to whom I believe I can listen. And yeah, I still need to check them, but I trust them if they speak. And there are other people that I don't trust. Marsha Blackburn says something is true. I assume the opposite. Uh, Jim Jordan, I assume the opposite. James Comer, don't even start me, man. That guy, like, you know, he makes it up all the time, right? But there are people whom I trust. So when um, somebody like um, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, speaks, I listen. That doesn't mean I'm not going to check, but it means I do think it is possible for people to have earned our our um, mine anyway, um, respect enough to say, you know, if Liz Cheney says something, um, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna assume that she is right unless I check and she's wrong because I trust her voice. Another person that I'll, I'll speak that I've never mentioned before, but I did a show yesterday with Sarah Longwell from the Bulwark. She is a conservative activist. She is a political scientist. We probably disagree about a lot of stuff. But if Sarah Longwell um, says that something is true, I don't really feel the need to check it, you know, because I trust her. She's, she's, she, I trust her. So take a deep breath, think about it. And certainly they can make mistakes, at which point I would fully expect that if I said to her, hey, wait a minute, your numbers don't work here, she would say, oh my God, you're right. But, and I'll fix it. But, but always take a deep breath and remember that anybody who is trying to get you to react really quickly almost certainly does not have your, um, your best interest at heart because they want you to react really quickly. Now, as I say, Iran, Russia, and China are working really, really hard to separate Americans, to make to make us lose faith in our democracy, and to make us um, give up on it. To say whatever, we might as well just go with a strong man. And this is in political terms, but also in, um, and I think the way to think about it, a form of warfare, even though it's not a hot war, they certainly don't wish us well. So, you know, if you need to think about yourself as a little soldier in this war saying, um, I'm going to check that before I get mad at my neighbor um, or before I get mad at my governor, before I get mad at my president, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fight back by saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before I believe X, let me see what actually happened. And I think that's an important thing to remember. So now a couple more questions you have asked about. Um, yes, Trump is cognitively impaired. I don't think there's any doubt about that. People have asked me repeatedly, having spent some time with President Biden lately, is he cognitively impaired? No, I do not believe he is. I think he's a very, very sharp man, intelligent wise. He um, he's very kind in person, not not mean. Um, he is he does have a, a speech impediment, and that makes him talk more slowly than somebody like me. Um, he uh, but he also has a really 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 crackerjack good team around him. So I think they're just aging very differently. I'm, I mean I'm not a I'm not a doctor I'm not a psychiatrist, but but I look at Trump and I used to watch old videos of him and he was very sharp. You know, he was funny, he was quick, he was, um, you know, he he played his audiences in, and I thought he was actually slipping a lot by 2016, but now it's really marked as I assume you have seen. All right, so, um, so that's one question you asked. Um, should Trump be able to run for office under the 14th Amendment? And I'm going to answer this the same way I did before. The meaning of the 14th Amendment to the people who wrote it is extraordinarily clear and under that, absolutely not. That's the historical answer. 
But the, the legal and the political answer is something different than that altogether. And actually, let's throw out the political answer because I think we should go with whatever the legal answer is. And, and lawyers like Terry Canefield have pointed out that it's not that clear how that was supposed to be executed in the Constitution. Now, great thinkers like um, Judge Michael Ludig and, uh, and Lawrence Tribe from Harvard have both said, hey, it's supposed to be self-executing, which means that you don't have to have Congress pass a law or anything else. It just is the same way you can't run for president if you're 22. Um, but there are debates over that. So should he be able to run? No. But I'm going to go back now to, historically to the idea that the framers did not expect political parties because if indeed you believe that lawmakers will do what is best for the country rather than what is best for the party, Donald Trump would never have been in office in the first place. And certainly he would never have made it through his first impeachment in which all of the senators, according to Ted Cruz from Texas, believed that he had what he had done was exactly what the House charged him with. That is, tried to extort help in the 2020 election from President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine before he would release monies that Congress had appropriated to give Ukraine fight um, to, to help fight off the 2014 invasion by Russia. And that was part of our national security. And that's, you know, that's breaking lots of laws. So, which you don't have to do, by the way, to, to be impeached and to be convicted. I've talked about that before. But um, um, uh, somebody just asked if Ted Cruz was reliable. Absolutely not. Ted, just don't even start me. Ted Cruz is pushing his podcast. He doesn't even care about governing anymore. Literally, he says stuff on the floor of Congress so he can then go have, say it on his podcast. Um, anyway, so... Um, so if we didn't have that political system where, for example, in 2019, um, Mitch McConnell, who was then Senate Majority Leader, told his people, listen, this isn't about Trump. It's about the 2020 election. So just shut up and vote, you know, that you're going to acquit him. That would the, the framers could not even have begun to think about that because they didn't understand that we are going to have political parties. And now, of course, we've got this political party that is defending Trump beyond, you know, the, you know, people say, should we have had a president who's committed, possibly committed crimes or all that? No, this never could have happened. This never could have happened without this, um, the, this extraordinary loyalty to this political party and how this has built up. All right. So now the other question that I think that, that I think you need to know is that, um, so he should, you know, the framers would have said, no, this would never happen. Nobody would turn to a criminal. And, and at this point, of course, he has been, um, been found liable for rape. I'm sorry, sexual assault. But then the judge said it is, it is what a normal person would, would consider rape. Um, but the New York laws are very, very specific about that. And for fraud, you know, that, that just is a non-starter for, um, for the, that kind of criminal behavior is a non-starter uh, from the, the framers. But now, of course, Trump is arguing that he should have presidential immunity for everything that he had done, that he did as president um, or after. And that's, I think it's or after. Um, and that's just, um, again, an absolute historical non-starter. The whole point of setting up a government based in the law rather than in heredity was to make sure that we would not have a king who could get away with whatever he wanted. And so what Trump is essentially arguing is that he should become a king. All right. You also asked about... Um, so, so what if Trump is found guilty after he is elected? Um, this is a real problem because, as you probably are aware, the Judge Eileen Cannon in Florida, who is in charge of the documents case in which Trump retained um, national security documents, highly secret national security documents, uh, when he was not allowed to have them, has, has it basically it seems pretty clear she's not going to let that come to trial um, before he before the election, and that was always the case that to me looked 
incredibly strong, not least because they had all the paperwork, but also because of the, the very many intelligence agencies who said, hey, he stole from us too. And you don't want to go up against the intelligence agencies. Um, I think what, what we're seeing all around us is Trump trying to delay all the cases so that they happen after the election with the expectation that one way or another he is going to be in office and then first of all he's going to make him go away he's going to appoint an, an attorney general and a justice department that gets rid of all those cases and instead prosecutes democrats and he has already said repeatedly what was good for me is what was good for them is going to be good for me i'm going to go after them the difference of course is that he appears to have been have committed crimes and juries, grand juries, not the Justice Department, but grand juries of his peers are the ones who say that he has committed crimes. I don't think you're going to get that with um, the kind of things that they want to launch against, for example, Joe Biden, whom they're, they are, remember, they are investigating now for a possible impeachment. And um, Alejandro Mayorkas, the Homeland Security uh, Secretary, who is, uh, they've already written the articles of impeachment, even though they haven't really had hearings yet, because they're so determined to make, you know, have another investigation. Remember that investigations are the bread and butter of the Republican Party because they seed in people's minds the idea that something bad has happened there the same way, for example, that you're thinking about Fonnie Willis, who, you know, you know, they, they, they threw crap at the wall and enough people said, oh my God, there's crap on the wall, that now things are slowing down over there and you're seeing all these articles about how this is gonna hurt the case. And that's what they do, they're playing public opinion. So uh, can he be found guilty after he's elected? One, that simply wouldn't happen, but two, remember, first of all, we haven't tried it, but second of all, during the Watergate crisis, the Department of Justice had a memo, it's never been tried in court or anything, saying that you couldn't try uh, or you couldn't indict a president um, well in office because it was, or you, 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 there were limits to what you could do to a president in office because um, it would take too much time, defending him would take too much of his time to to run the country at the same time. So I think if he's reelected, these all go away, is the bottom line. All right, so a couple of questions here. Um, so Peter Adams has said it would be great to have a top 10 list of things from Biden. I think somebody's working on that. I think she might be here right now. If she's not, I hope her ears just perked up. And second of all, uh, another question you asked, uh, where's my other list here? Um, um, I don't remember what I was gonna say. All right, so so that was what you, um, you uh, asked about. Oh no, the other thing you asked about was the economy. You keep hearing the Republicans out there saying, well, they want to go back to Trump because the economy was so much better under Trump. And someone said, is that true? And the answer is no. I, I don't use a lot of profanity um, on these chats, but I have to say that falls under the category of BS, right? In the, Trump kept bragging that he would get U.S. growth up to 3%. In the first three years of his presidency, and my statistics by this, by, about this, by the way, come from the Wall Street Journal, which is no hotbed of, of leftiness, right? In the first three years of his presidency, before the pandemic hit, because of course the pandemic just tanked everything, um, the growth, the annual growth in the United States was 2.5%. It's fine, you know, it's fine, it's fine. But under Biden, in the last quarter of 2023, it was 4.9%. Now, there's been a huge, obviously, he and you can't really do the same sort of comparison because he came in with the pandemic that where everything had crashed and all that. So, um, so it's a little harder to do an apples to apples comparison. But it is there's no doubt that the Biden policies of investing in the middle class and workers have dramatically increased growth. So Biden has brought manufacturing back to the United States. He has poured a ton of money into infrastructure, not only roads, roads and bridges, but also into build, building um, chips plants and investing in science with the idea of bringing home our um, 
our supply chains, which is one of the reasons that Mexico has just overtaken China as our largest trading partner is because of the attempt to put so many more factories in Mexico and having supply chains go that way. Um, and the during the Biden administration, we had bad inflation, right, which was kind of to be expected, not only because of the supply chains and all the money in the economy when people hadn't been able to spend it during the, the pandemic, but also because of what's known as greedflation, that is a number of companies really hiked their prices and then never brought them back down. And that's there's been a lot in the news about that lately. So you could expect that, but one of the statistics that has come out is how much faster actual wages have grown than the inflation. So lots of people have made a lot of money. The difference is there are people at the bottom of the economic scale instead of the people at the top for a change. So the idea that things are better under Trump is just wrong. You know, and he's, he said things like, well, you know, if you look at how much money that the farmers have made under me, and you know, I put these tariffs on China and you got all this money. Well, that's true, but they got that money because there was so much, such a hit to our soybean industry, for example, with those tariffs that the government basically just paid the, the farmers off. And that, that was tax money that went to them. It was not some great, brilliant thing that Bi that Trump had done. So what Biden has done is he has taken a look at the um, at the the whole economic system and said, hey, let's rebuild the things that we had before the Republicans took over in 1981 and killed it all, and and really try to invest in our manufacturing and in our um, you know in our roads and in all the things that really helped helped our economy to grow before the Republicans said, no, we want to put all the money at the top and they will invest in stuff. And, you know, one of the things I think I said on something the other day, I, I, you know, I kept writing about this and saying, hey, it's working. Hey, it's working. Hey, it's working. And, and, and I kept reading in the papers, nah, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. And finally, there was one night where I sat there and thought, have I just drunk the Kool-Aid? I mean, is it really going to be bad? And I'm just not seeing it. And then it hit me that of course it was going to be fine because we've done it before. We know how it turns out. And that's the piece that that really kind of woke me up to the idea that it's not that Biden is out doing something totally brand new, although there are new aspects of it, so much as the fact that he is really resurrecting a much fairer economy that we had before 1981. And we know how it plays out. So it's not like where he's flying by the seat of his pants. He's really trying to break up monopolies, which is one thing that his um, Commerce Department has done under Lena Khan. He's trying to invest in ordinary people. He's trying to bring supply chains home. He's basically dialing the clock back to what it was before the Republicans, that old guard Republicans, took over. All right, so I wanted to go in a direction that you did not ask about simply because I'm a little surprised that nobody is talking about it and I'm fascinated by it. So as you probably know, and some of the people may actually be listening here, I'm an Americanist and I didn't really know a lot about 20th century foreign affairs. I'm actually very good on foreign affairs through World War I. But then it gets really complicated. And I was a 19th century scholar, so I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. And of course, the thing that got me really involved in writing the letters from an American was the, the, the everything going on in Ukraine. And, you know, Biden, I'm sorry, uh, Trump trying to extort Volodymyr Zelensky and all that. And, and I started trying to figure that out. And uh, a now dear friend of mine who is Ukrainian and knows her history incredibly well and all that really started coaching me through many bigger issues in foreign affairs. And I got really, I think the word obsessed is not unfair with American foreign affairs. And I thought, why don't we talk about that more? Like until 1947, that's the point I look at it. Um, when we get the National Security Act that really centers foreign policy in the White House, people talked about foreign affairs all the time. And now when we talk about foreign affairs, no one really seems to understand what's going on. They, they just sort of have a knee-jerk reaction that always seems to me sort of to be rooted in our experience in Vietnam, even if what's going on doesn't have anything to do with Vietnam. So in this moment where we are now, I'm going to start focusing a lot more on foreign affairs in part because it's so important to us right now as Americans, but also because it's really interesting. Because if Biden has been transformative in the US, he has also been transformative overseas. And so one of the places I wanna start here is with Ukraine. What Ukraine is doing in holding off Vladimir Putin's Russia is 
trying to protect, obviously itself, and I don't mean to denigrate that, but trying to protect Europe and trying to protect NATO and the, the, the pieces of a global order based in rules rather than in one person, one big country being able to take everything over, that the United States and other countries put together after World War II to try and stop another world war. So, of course, pushing against that are people like Vladimir Putin and Viktor Orban in Hungary and perhaps to some degree um, Xi Jinping in China, people who are interested in getting rid of that rules-based order a little bit. I, I, I don't want to say that for, for Xi, who actually needs it for a lot of things. But certainly, Putin does not want to have a rules-based order. He wants to be able to take over Ukraine. He wants to be able to take over different countries because that will enable him to have more resources, more people, and become more powerful. And so one of the things to be watching right now is the fact that anybody who really understands our national security recognizes that investing in Ukraine's attempt to protect itself is actually good for the American economy because what we're doing is we're shipping them our old weaponry and rebuilding stuff for ourselves. But it's also good for the world because it's going to help us protect uh, a, a, a rules-based order, the UN, the, all the different ways, NATO, um, CEDO, all the different ways in which the world is knit together so that you can't just get a dictator coming in and saying, I'm going to take everything over. The fact that the radical right in the United States is blocking aid to Ukraine is hugely problematic. It's problematic for Ukraine. It's problematic for the world. It is also hugely problematic for our national security. And they know that. And that makes me wonder a lot what they're up to. And this is one of the reasons that you're seeing uh, Biden, for example, and the Democrats, and also a number of Republicans saying, you know, come on, guys, why are we not supporting Ukraine? Because Ukraine needs support right now. And interestingly enough, other countries are jumping in to help. And they're, you know, but, but there's no doubt we're the big dog in the fight and we need to be doing that. So that's one thing to keep your eye on. Um, the other thing that it surprises me that we are not seeing in our papers much is what's happening in the Middle East. Because if you remember when Hamas attacked the, uh, uh, Israel on October 7th, um, the, there, there's been a lot of moving pieces since then. And what, what, what it's worth remembering here, first of all, is that the first thing that Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken did, and this is like public, you can find this in any of all of their speeches, is they said, this must not spread across the Middle East. This must stay contained. So the US moved a couple of carrier groups, which are not just carrier uh, ships, they're also helicopters and troops and, and submarines into the region. They kept saying, we're gonna stand behind Israel. Do not escalate, not escalate, that's the wrong word. Do not spread this war. So if you think about that, that, that is an umbrella over everything. You know, and you hear a lot again in our papers, well, you know, Biden is funding attacks on, um, on Gaza. That idea of protecting Israel, which is an ally, um, to keep make sure that that it keeps a lid on attacks on Israel from Hamas, the Houthis from Yemen, and especially Hezbollah in Lebanon, is a way to try and keep that from escalating. And they're very clear about this. Now, this also explains the attacks on the Houthis in Yemen, who are trying desperately to destabilize that that roof over everything. And it's worth remembering when you think about those things that those groups I just mentioned, Hamas, the Houthis, and Hezbollah, those are non-state actors. They are not the states under which they, they exist. The states in the Middle East, the Arab states, have not signed on to that war. They have not stood behind Hamas. They have not stood behind Hezbollah and the Houthis because they don't want the whole place to explode either. So if you think about that larger Middle East and Biden saying, don't fight, start this fight. Now, 
the other thing you see in the news all the time is Biden is, is just supporting everything Netanyahu does. That is absolutely not true. From the very beginning, the Biden administration has, has really put pressure on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu not to attack Gaza to the degree he wanted. So if you remember early on, Biden exchanged a visit to the area for an opening of people going, of relief going into Gaza. He has tried desperately to try and keep the, um, the Israelis from expand, under Netanyahu from expanding that war. So they, we know now that the Netanyahu wanted to attack Hezbollah and his part of his war cabinet and, and the Americans said, don't you dare do it. That's gonna, that's gonna increase the war the way we don't want it to increase. So there is this attempt to, to stabilize that situation and to keep a lid on Netanyahu. And you can now see that splitting apart with Netanyahu saying, you know, we're going to do what we want over here because he's got his own problem, much like Donald Trump's. He's in trouble with his legal issues and he's trying to keep his coalition behind him, which is a far right coalition, even though he is his his approval ratings are absolutely in the toilet. So the whole reason I gave you this whole thing is that since the very beginning, and this is interesting because you keep reading in the papers, people saying, oh, Biden's changing his tune. And I'm like, no, nah, he's been saying it all along, actually. Since the very beginning, Netanyahu's power in Israel was based on the idea that he could keep Israel safe. October 7th blew that up. He couldn't do that. His approval rating has dropped. He is much weaker than he was in the past. And since the very beginning, the Americans were talking about a two-state solution, resurrecting the two-state solution. Gradually, more and more people have been talking about creating a Palestinian state. And if you remember, the Israelis came out under Netanyahu and said, not happening, we need to control all this, and, um, and we're gonna take over Gaza. And Netanyahu was forced to walk that back um, after a conversation with the Americans. And increasingly, you're hearing, you know, everybody kept talking about a ceasefire, and Israel said, "I'm not going. We're not going to leave Hamas in power," and um, and the Americans back that idea. But people haven't switched over to the idea that a two-state solution is increasingly talked about, and increasingly within the imagination of people. And that's something I think to be watching for going forward, because. It is part of what's happening in the Middle East is part of, I think, a much larger transformation that the Biden administration is trying to put in place. And I, I'm very much an agnostic on this, I have to say, but it is fascinating. And that's that the old post-war um, idea of um, the world that, that was basically divided in two and, and there was going to be this this idea that there was this this democracies pushing back against the against the uh, communism that's gone. So what's going to replace it? And as soon as um, as Blinken took office, he and Biden Biden gave a speech at the at the um, State Department on on February fourth, in which in twenty twenty one, in which he said diplomacy is back on the table. And what they, I, th I think, are constructing is the idea of diplomacy that brings together countries in areas to solve their own issues without it being one big dog against another big dog. And you can see this, I think, in immigration where they're trying to do that. You can see it for sure in Africa, where Biden, the Biden administration has worked very hard to make sure that the African Union get, got a seat on the G20. I think it's now the G21. Um, and you can see it in, of course, in the Indo-Pacific in a huge way where the administration has really supported Vietnam, for example, and the Pacific Islands and, and letting people have um, many more, much more access to resources so they can take a bigger seat at the table. But I think you're also seeing it in the Middle East. And, and it's really interesting to see um, whether or not that could work. Because if it did, um, and if, in fact, the Arab states poured the kind of money into that Palestinian state that they have said they will do if, um, if Hamas is not in control and if there is a viable Palestinian authority, um, it, 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 it's a game changer. 
and it's the the reason I mention it here is because it there are many moving pieces, and I don't think they're getting represented in the United States press, and I think you kind of have to understand them to face our upcoming election because if you just look at what you're hearing and not seeing the bigger picture, it it I think misrepresents what's actually um, happening there. All right, so um, so let me leave you with with a word of hope if that wasn't enough hope, um, and it wasn't. Um, remember that the only way that the radical right can take power in the United States is for them to be able to do what they are trying to do, which is to convince the rest of us that they are already in power, that our voices don't matter. So now is your time. Take up oxygen. Find a friend. Don't do it alone unless you're one of those people who feels comfortable doing that. Find a friend. Um, volunteer to be election workers. Get out the vote. Talk to your friends. Um, you know, we'll have we'll maybe have some more ideas on this site sooner rather than later. But um, but remember that there is never a, a reactionary right movement that ever gets more than about 33% of the population at the top. But they get the rest to go along through intimidation, through fear, through apathy, through the idea that they can't make a difference. So don't be that way. We, you know, we have, is it 10 months left to go? Uh, and, and there's a lot of work to be done, but it's also creative and it's fun. And if you get overwhelmed, don't, don't get involved. You know, take take a break from it. I got to say, I wrote by accident last night um, because I thought, I just don't care. I don't want to do any more of this stupid political stuff, which is why I ended up writing so much about Mexico. Um, but you're allowed to take a break. But when you, when you feel like you can get engaged, do. Because, you know, this is our moment. Um, the same way that the 1850s were a moment for Lincoln's people and the same way that the 1890s and the 19 aughts were, were Teddy Roosevelt's people and the same way that the 30s and the 40s were FDR's people. So now's our time. And, and I have every confidence that we can do it. All right. Thank you for being here. And I will try and do these as much as possible, but I'm going to see a lot of you on the road for the next several months. Thanks for being here.